Hello, my name is Jim Nittles, and this is my amazing story. It's incredible how being content can blind us to the hidden truths surrounding us. Suddenly, without warning, everything collapses when you stumble upon the revelation that your wife was unfaithful. As if that wasn't enough, I first suspected my 18-year-old daughter and her friends of sneaking into the basement to help themselves to a beer I brewed with my own hands. But, to my surprise, when I watched the footage taken by the camera installed in the basement, I found that my wife was enjoying my beer with her secret boyfriend. An unexpected turn of events, isn't it? As an intriguing piece of news, let me share the heartbreaking story of my friend JT. He also lives in Atlanta, and we are both members of the local beer club. Imagine a shock when he learned the terrible truth that his wife, with whom he had lived for a quarter of a century, had betrayed him for more than two decades. At a recent meeting of our beer club, he plucked up the courage and shared his personal experience with us. Among the many valuable tips that he expressed, one stood out in particular, take off your rose-colored glasses and carefully study the state of your marriage. This remark struck a chord with me because I also have my own story. My name is Jim, and I have been happily married to Karen for almost 28 years. Together, we have three beautiful children. Life seemed idyllic in every way. Karen, the epitome of elegance and grace, comes from a rich and noble family. Despite her 49 years, she radiates an ageless radiance that can easily deceive anyone who thinks she is only 35. As for my upbringing, I can't say for sure whether I belong to the middle class or not, but I was lucky enough to grow up in a caring family living in a cozy town near Atlanta. I am the younger brother in a family with two boys. Our upbringing was very peculiar as we lived next to our beloved grandparents. My father, by the will of fate, worked conscientiously in my respected grandfather's hardware store, following a family tradition. My brother Ken and I started helping out at the store after school and on weekends. Ken, in an effort to broaden his horizons, continued his education at the Georgia Institute of Technology and became an experienced electrical engineer currently working for a well-known paper company in South Carolina. Inspired by the footsteps of my wonderful older brother, I also set off to Georgia Tech as a computer science specialist. Among the huge number of memories associated with my hometown, one thing stands out vividly, the presence of Joey, a typical well-to-do child in every small town. I had no idea that in the end, Joey and I would form such a strong friendship that it would overcome time and age. We became inseparable best friends from the age of three. While my academic quest led me to the Georgia Institute of Technology, Joey chose Emory University, paving his own path of intellectual search. By the will of fate, I found myself in the role of Joey's matchmaker during his visits to my part of the city. In turn, he kindly reciprocated when I dared to enter his territory. I had no idea that one of the blind dates that Joey arranged for me at Emory, namely Karen, would captivate my heart like no other. It was the only blind date that prompted me to call for a repeat appointment throughout senior year. Karen and I treasured every moment we could snatch from our busy schedules. The more time we spent together, the more I became convinced of my desire to spend my whole life with this extraordinary woman. But before I had the courage to make an offer, I had to overcome one obstacle instilled in me by my grandparents and parents, the virtues of diligence and responsibility. I felt obliged to take care of providing for my future family. Karen came from a wealthy family and never knew what financial responsibility was. But my pride and principles did not allow me to live off the wealth of her parents. If Karen had agreed to marry me, we would have had to make our own way without any help from her family. Fortunately, she happily accepted the offer. Since early childhood, I was taught that it was important to save money for the future, and I diligently saved 10% of every penny I earned. It was with part of these savings that I bought an engagement ring for Karen, a symbol of my devotion and love. The very next day after I proposed, we plucked up the courage and broke the news to her parents. While Karen and her mother were radiating excitement, immersed in wedding plans, Karen's father and I respectfully withdrew, giving the women the opportunity to enjoy the conversation in peace. After I shared the good news with Karen's parents, her father kindly invited me to his office for a private conversation. He showed genuine interest in my plans after graduation, and I willingly told him that I had accepted a job at a well-known corporation right here in Atlanta. He noted with satisfaction that he was familiar with some of the leaders of this company. During our conversation, time seemed to slip away, and in the end, it was time to say goodbye. 
Karen and her mother set off to prepare for the wedding, which lasted 14 months, leaving enough time for a thorough study of every detail. In the meantime, I focused on developing my budding career, knowing that the next year promised promising prospects and opportunities. Three months after our first conversation with Karen's parents, Ben sent another invitation to discuss which aroused my curiosity and anticipation. He confessed his affection for me, acknowledged Karen's sympathy, but stressed that his duty as a father is to protect his daughter and their family. Perplexed, I pondered the meaning of his words. At that moment, he handed me a piece of paper, a marriage contract which he asked me to sign. My father's words echoed in my head, advising me never to sign anything without careful study, questioning, consultation, and deliberation. While I was reading the contract, he patiently waited for my decision. The document stated that in the event of the dissolution of our marriage within the first five years, I was entitled to an amount of $100,000. In addition, the agreement clearly stated that I was not entitled to receive any additional assets from Karen or her family. Furthermore, the agreement provided for a gradual increase in the monetary limit every decade, and as a result, by the 25th anniversary of our wedding, the limit would reach $5 million. Caught off guard, I was speechless, considering how to react. After a few minutes, I found the strength to say, Sir, I sincerely love your daughter and I dream that she will be devoted to you all her life. But I can appreciate the pragmatic perspective of this proposal. I will take this document with me and carefully study its consequences. He nodded back and said, Okay, I'll wait patiently for your decision. Knowing that my father is my most reliable and loyal friend, I immediately turned to him for advice. He carefully read the document, not once but twice, after which he said, Jim, now it's clear why Ben needs this agreement in its current form. It provides exclusively for the interests of his family. But what are your desires, and how do you want to protect them? We delved into the discussion of my desires, emotions, aspirations, and long-term vision. Together with Karen, my father said, I've always been of the opinion that if someone asks you to give up something, they should be willing to make sacrifices. Ben's lawyer seems to be putting the Thompson family's well-being first. It is quite obvious that Ben's lawyer was hired in order to prioritize the interests of his client, considering you as a villager with minimal stakes but significant potential benefits. Both you and I understand what lies at the heart of this agreement. Ben, despite the fact that he recognizes your current love for Karen, has concerns about the possible development of events. If any of us were in his place, we would most likely take similar precautions. After a short pause, my father continued, Jim, a marriage can break up for various reasons. This prenuptial agreement covers all possible reasons. If studying together in college is one thing, then overcoming the difficulties associated with the married life of a working couple is a completely different matter. Are you sure that you and Karen will be able to overcome any difficulties that may arise? It is possible that life together may be complicated by circumstances related to work, social circle, financial difficulties, family influence, or any other factors. Do you feel like getting Ben's money in case your marriage doesn't work out? What situation would prompt you to demand financial compensation from him? My God, I am grateful that I turned to my father for advice. I turned to my brother Ken and got his opinion, which basically coincided with my father's opinion. After talking with several other trustees, I determined what changes I would like to make to the agreement. During our next visit to Karen's parents, I approached Ben and asked for a brief conversation. He looked at me and offered to retire to the office to give the ladies an opportunity to discuss wedding issues. When we entered the office, I took out the prenuptial agreement that Ben had given me earlier. Sir, I began, after careful consideration, I think some changes need to be made. He was about to intervene, but then he paused and nodded his consent to continue. I fully understand and respect your point of view, I continued. And I want you to know that I am marrying your daughter out of sincere love for her. Therefore, I propose the following, during the first decade of our marriage, I propose to set aside $100,000 annually in an investment account. We will jointly determine the most suitable investment options for these funds. In order to strengthen our relations and develop a deeper connection, I propose to hold quarterly meetings to review and discuss these investments. In addition, in the unfortunate event that our marriage does not prosper, you will keep the funds deposited. 
Karen and I will share equally all the property acquired during our union, with the exception of the property received from her and my family, which will remain separate. In the event of a divorce due to my adultery, the money will remain with you, and Karen will receive 100% ownership of the property acquired during our marriage. This condition does not apply to property received from your or my parents. If the divorce happens as a result of Karen's adultery, I will be entitled to the money and 100% ownership of the property acquired during our marriage. Again, this condition does not apply to property received from your or my parents. On our 43rd wedding anniversary, Karen and I will get full control of the investment account. I have two questions. Firstly, why is the deadline set at 43 years? Also, could you elaborate on the concept of separation of adultery? As for the 43-year term, it's very simple. By this time, we will both be 65 years old, and the funds will be used for our retirement. Understanding my explanation, he grinned and gestured for me to continue. In case our marriage turns out to be unsuccessful, despite our sincere efforts to reconcile differences, everything will be divided fairly. We sincerely tried to make everything work out for us, so why should one person be punished? But if one of us commits adultery, it will be a deliberate act that will destroy the foundation of trust and fidelity necessary for the prosperity of marriage. Marriage is a union of two people forming a single whole. Our goal is to remain faithful to each other throughout our lives. If Karen is dissatisfied with our relationship, she has the opportunity to file for divorce, which will give her the right to any romantic ties she wishes. I, in turn, undertake to remain faithful to Karen, except that I will demand retribution only if she commits adultery during our marriage. Does this answer your questions? Yes, my son, you have indeed given satisfactory answers. I will arrange for a revised version of the agreement to be prepared for you. Now, let's join the women. A few weeks later, we invited Karen to discuss the prenuptial agreement with her. Karen was shocked by such a revelation and did not even think that such a thing was possible. When she finished reading, she looked up and asked, Jim, you really don't mind? Jim replied, Yes, Karen. Intrigued, she reread the agreement for a moment, perplexed. She asked Jim, Why 43 years, and what kind of talk is this about adultery? Laughing, I replied, your father asked me the same questions. In 43 years, we will both be 65 years old. We will assume that this is our pension fund. Karen was sitting, and a smile slowly appeared on her face. She realized that if they both strive for their marriage to be successful and it does not work out, then they will have the opportunity to divorce and move on, knowing that they gave it all their strength. Adultery is a conscious act of treason when a person secretly deceives his partner about his location and communication. It's hard for me to imagine anything more heartbreaking and deceptive in marriage. If I'm not enough for you or if you want someone else, I beg you to have an open conversation and file for divorce. I don't want to be disrespected and make a fool of myself. My love for you remains unchanged, and I expect the same loyalty from you. Our wedding day was filled with joy, and the honeymoon was just magical. And now, we have been married for almost 28 years, and we have three children. Our eldest, Dan, who is now 26 years old, bears the surname of my late father, Benny, at the age of 25, who enjoys outdoor activities, currently works in one of Ben's companies. Then, realizing Benny's potential, actively mentors him to eventually become the manager of the family business. In addition, Benny has recently been accepted to the MBA program, which he will start this fall. Interestingly, the name Benny comes from the name of Karen's father, which gives his personality a special shade. This event brought great joy to my father, as he is very glad that he has a family member who can continue the legacy of the farm and hardware store. In contrast, my brother and I chose to leave the farm as soon as we had the opportunity. Also, our unexpected child, Emma, recently turned 18, and I have to admit that she has an amazing ability to effortlessly influence me. Our daughter is the most outstanding athlete among our children, and she has received a full scholarship to play football at UNC starting next year. When our sons left for college, I turned the playroom in the basement into a charming beer pub. My wife, Karen, and I are very happy to hold meetings, and the pub has become a favorite vacation spot for our family and friends. But in the last few months, I've been under the suspicion that someone is stealing my carefully prepared beer. Although I don't keep strict records, 
This suspicion has intensified. Having prepared several bottles for the beer club meeting, I was horrified to find that there was not a single bottle of IPA among them. During an evening meeting, I reached out to Fred Jones to discuss my concerns about my 18-year-old daughter sneaking a beer from my beer bar. I asked Fred if he allowed his daughter to drink beer, to which he replied that if he wanted to let her try it. Interested in my suspicions, Fred asked about the reasons for my confidence. I explained that whenever I went out of town, the beer mysteriously disappeared, but I quickly dismissed the possibility that it could be Karen, as I had never seen her drink a whole glass of my beer. Karen always preferred wine. On the other hand, the boys who visit my pub seem to like beer, and I often send them home with a case of beer each. Thus, Amy and her friends remain the only potential culprits. I have a great idea, we can install a motion-controlled surveillance camera in the beer hall to catch her in the act. Can you set up the camera of tomorrow morning while Amy is at school? Will 11 a.m. be suitable? Thank you in advance, I'll be waiting for you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Frank was punctual and efficiently installed everything in just 15 minutes. He also took the time to teach me how to operate it, which took about 20 minutes. Do you think we should tell Karen about the camera? I think it's better not to, as she might accidentally reveal it to Amy. By the way, where are you planning your next trip? I'm going to Cleveland next week. I'm flying out on Wednesday and coming back on Thursday. Have a good trip, and let me know if you manage to capture her on film. We left the system running while we went out for lunch. For the next two weeks, every time I visited my pub, I drank beer and looked through the records. Only the cleaners who came in on Tuesday and Friday mornings, as well as myself, got on the tape. I arrived home from Cleveland only at 1 o'clock on Friday morning due to a flight delay of two hours. I spent Friday working in the office. In the evening, Karen and I had dinner with her parents and then attended the performance. According to my recollections, we had a barbecue at home after the Sunday service. I dozed off in a comfortable chair, returning home on Monday evening when Karen was at a meeting and Amy was at soccer practice. I decided to watch the tape, but after five minutes of watching, my whole reality collapsed. I was expecting to see Amy and her friends, but to my horror, the recording showed Karen walking into the pub, intertwining her fingers with Jerome. It is worth noting that Jerome, along with his wife Diana and daughter, moved to our neighborhood about eight months ago. My world turned upside down when I saw my wife leaning over the arm of my favorite chair, engaged in an intimate act with Gerald. I was numb from shock and began to stare blankly at the screen, unable to realize the situation unfolding before my eyes. It was only when it dawned on me that I was actually watching a recording of Sadie's barbecue that I was able to get out of my stupor. Disappointment gripped me and I regretted that I had not installed an audio recorder next to the camera. My initial shock turned into anger, and eventually, it turned into rage. Throughout my upbringing, my father always emphasized that you need to solve problems with a clear mind and not let anger control your actions. First of all, it is necessary to collect all the necessary information and thoroughly understand the problem. It is very important to make informed decisions. In anger, people often do stupid things. To get concrete evidence, I decided to take a break to calm down and review the recording, taking deep breaths to recover. It became clear that this was not their first incident. While Jerome was getting dressed, Karen brought him another beer and began to dress herself, and he continued to drink my beer. This audacious man not only showed disrespect to my wife but also took advantage of the situation, drank my beer, and treated himself to my bottles. At this point, I stopped recording and immediately contacted Frank. He answered on the third ring. Hello, this is Jim Nittles, I said. Do you have a few minutes? Frank answered in the affirmative, and I asked further, Did you catch your daughter stealing beer? My answer surprised Frank. No, I said in a worried voice. I found my wife with a neighbor, and I need your professional services. Expressing sympathy, he said, I'm sorry to hear that. What do you need? I answered Frank directly, everything. Can we meet sometime tomorrow? I paused for a moment to check my schedule. Wait, I said to Frank. Let me consult my diary. After a quick check, I suggested a time. How about four o'clock tomorrow? I asked. Frank agreed and said, great, see you then. Before ending the conversation, I asked Frank, what do I need to take with me? 
he presented a list of items. The tape, his name, address, phone number, work address, Karen's schedule, and when you leave town again. After confirming our plan, I said, see you at four. Fortunately, Karen hadn't come home yet, which gave me an opportunity to collect my thoughts and regain control of my emotions. About an hour later, Amy came downstairs, informing me that she had come. We went upstairs together and started talking about the upcoming football game. Reassuring her, I promised that I would be there and support her. Being a person who is completely immersed in solving problems, I decided not to sleep and wait for my unfaithful wife to return home. I couldn't help wondering if she was really at the meeting that night or if she had some kind of illicit affair. In any case, I thought to myself, Frank will get to the truth. Time passed, and at exactly 3.55, I entered Frank's office, fully prepared for any challenges that awaited me. Expressing sympathy, Frank said, I'm sorry to hear that Karen cheated on you. In response, I explained, I talked to JT, who mentioned how you and Mike Ford handled his case. You're a professional, what do you recommend? I shared my awareness of the marriage contract and the existence of sufficient evidence of adultery. But my curiosity wasn't limited to that. I continued, I want to know everything about Jerome, his biography, his spouse, his family. I want him to be monitored around the clock. I want to get an idea about his activities, about the people he communicates with, about how he earns money, which is of the greatest value in his life. Disappointment heated up my words, and I declared, I want to be watched not only for him but also for Karen. Frank recognized the magnitude of the task and realized that it would take time and effort to collect all the necessary information. Assuring me of his readiness, he said, I will ask my staff to start working on this in the morning. To enhance surveillance, he suggested installing video cameras and voice recorders in every room of my house, as well as in Karen's car. Realizing the importance of audio evidence, I remarked, it's a pity we don't have an audio recording from last week. I told Frank that I would be going on a business trip in the near future. In three weeks, I'll be gone for four days this time, I informed him. After assessing the timing, he replied, great, by that time we should have enough information for you. Did you bring the tape? Frank asked. I replied, yes, I brought everything you asked for. Then he asked me how to get to my house to install the new system. I told him, Karen plays bridge on Thursday mornings. How long will it take you? Frank replied, it will take us at least two hours. Having planned a schedule, I suggested, okay, let's meet at my house on Thursday at 9.30. Leaving Frank's office, I felt relieved, realizing that the case was progressing. Now, all that remained was to wait. Three weeks later, I finally said goodbye to my wife and went on a trip to Austin, Texas. The past three weeks seemed like an eternity, burdened with anticipation and anxiety. I put all the necessary legal documents prepared by Mike Ford safely in my briefcase, knowing full well that it was I who would have to hand over the divorce papers to Karen. Instead of going to Austin as planned, I stopped by JT's, knowing that my marriage would be annulled the next day. As expected, Frank soon arrived to deliver the long-awaited news. It was shocking that less than 45 minutes after my departure, this freak came to us, and they engaged in intimate activities in our own bed. To make matters worse, Karen brazenly demanded that he spend the next night with her under the pretext that our daughter, Amy, was going to spend the night with a friend. After carefully considering my options for countless hours, I finally came to a decision on how to deal with the exposure of Karen's infidelity, to tell the truth. I really wanted to kick them both out of the house, leaving them naked on the street, but I chose a more civilized approach. In the afternoon, I contacted Karen's father and asked for a meeting at his office. Sensing the seriousness of the situation, I explained that I had encountered a problem and needed his advice in private. Having agreed to meet in the evening at 6.30, he prepared for our conversation. When I drove up to his office, Ben, Karen's father, met me with a puzzled expression on his face. He felt that something important was going on because I had never asked for a meeting in his office before. Addressing him with respect, I said, Sir, for all 29 years, I have always considered you to be another father in my life. I am grateful for the connection that has developed between us during this time. Because of this deep respect and the role you play in my life, I decided to approach you with the same level of respect that I would approach my own father. In this situation, confused by my words, 
He asked, Jim, what are you talking about? Taking a deep breath, I plucked up the courage and told the truth. Well, sir, tonight I'm going to hand Karen the divorce papers for adultery. Shocked and confused, he asked me, what on earth is going on? Gathering my thoughts, I explained, I have recordings of Karen and her lover engaging in intimate activities in our marital bed. Moreover, your daughter and her boyfriend are currently doing it in our bed. Stunned by such a revelation, he replied, this can't be happening. Unfortunately, it's true, sir, I said. I've been considering different approaches to this situation. After sharing my initial wish, I confessed what I really want is to meet them directly and kick them out of my house. Your incredulous reaction was expected. You're not kidding, he exclaimed. Realizing the significance of our relationship, I confirmed, yes, I really would like to do that. But out of respect for you, I have developed an alternative plan that I would like to discuss with you. For the next 45 minutes, we had a conversation outlining the plan I proposed, which in the end, was chosen as the most optimal. At 9.15, Ben, Frank Jones, Brad Williams, Mike Ford, Steve Collins, and an Atlanta police detective gathered at my house. After introducing everyone, I said, Karen and her lover are now in the master bedroom. When we gathered on the porch and discussed what was happening, Frank's earpiece notified him of their intimate actions. Sighing heavily, I unlocked the front door and led the audience into the living room. Turning to Ben, I said sympathetically, I'm sure you don't want to see your daughter in such a delicate situation. Why don't you wait downstairs? Having calmed him down, I once again confirmed that I undertook to refrain from physical influence on Karen. Behind us, Brad carried a video camera ready to capture the evidence. Before entering the bedroom, it was important to us that they knew they were being recorded, both for legal purposes and to confirm our presence. According to our plan, we settled down outside the bedroom door, patiently waiting for Jerome to be ready to leave. As we walked down the corridor towards the bedroom, we could hear the sounds of their intimacy. These were not just the sounds of casual encounters, but the passionate sounds of love. We went into the room where Karen was sitting, clutching a sheet to her neck, and Jerome was trying to cover himself with a pillow. Addressing Jerome, I introduced the persons accompanying me. Jerome, let me introduce you to this esteemed company. First of all, we have Frank Jones, an experienced investigator. Mike Ford, my divorce lawyer, is standing next to him. And finally, meet Steve Collins, an Atlanta police detective. Brad skillfully controlled the camera, filming the unfolding events. Despite the burning desire to kick them both out of the house, I was hatching alternative plans for their fate. Before we continue, I said firmly to them, I want you to understand that the whole house has been vigilantly recording every moment for the past three weeks. Taking a deep breath, I continued, addressing Karen directly, Karen, it's no secret that Jerome is someone from your past, an old flame. During these three weeks, I found out that you were going to marry him, not me. Looking around the room, I was convinced that everyone knew the truth. Everyone in this room knows that you decided to marry me only because your parents wouldn't approve of your relationship with Jerome. There is no denying that you entered into this marriage to fulfill their desire to have grandchildren and secure an heir. I understand how important it is to have heirs, and it seems that you have successfully taken care of the continuation of your family for another generation. But Karen quickly interrupted me, pleading, Jim, please stop. I'm not interested in listening to everything you have to say, either now or in the future. You can't change anything about the undeniable fact that you betrayed our marriage by having an intimate relationship with another man in our own bed. You can't expect me to believe that it was a simple mistake. I have a recording that shows how you invited this man to spend the night with you after he had already had an intimate relationship with you twice in our bed just two hours after I left town. So don't try to change everything. I can't bring myself to believe a word you say. I looked at Jerome, addressing him with a mixture of contempt and admiration. I have to say that you are a really experienced player, I remarked. I told him that for the last three weeks, our team had been monitoring him, finding out all possible information with Frank's help. I asked him to play a DVD intended for Jerome and Karen to watch. Drawing attention to Karen, I asked her to be attentive, emphasizing that I wanted her to see the true essence of her lover. During the viewing, scenes of Jerome's intimacy with Karen were shown, as well as individual episodes of his relationship with two other women. But the most revealing thing was ahead, 
a scene that would expose Jerome's true nature. In another scene captured on video, Jerome was seen with his friends at a restaurant last week. The conversation at the table took an alarming turn when someone asked Jerome about his relationships with married women. Without hesitation, he boasted, Yes, damn it, I can't resist relationships with married women. There is nothing better than performing intimate acts with them in the bed of their own husbands, Jerome proudly said when asked about his recent encounters after returning to Atlanta. Oh, yes, there are three married women in my entourage now. Interestingly, one of them is someone you all may remember, Karen Thompson from college, confirming their memories. Someone said, Yes, isn't this the woman who shamelessly visited our apartment on her wedding day so that you would do such things? Jerome gleefully agreed, stating, Yes, this is exactly the woman I'm talking about. With a mixture of disbelief and disappointment, I continued to share my knowledge. I've been sleeping with her for the last five months. Can you imagine? The weight of this discovery hung in the air as he paused for a moment. She's my neighbor, he said, adding another layer of deception to the already painful truth. Reflecting on the past, he remembered how Karen wanted the last intimacy before the wedding, assuring that after that she would be faithful to me. That's right, I confirmed, nodding at the accuracy of my memories. The recording continued for a while. She really kept her word up to five months ago. A feeling of bewilderment filled the room as he continued. Now she tells me she regrets marrying him and not me. Can you believe it? She really believes that I would choose her as my wife. The tension was building. Jerome was already shouting at me in anger, and Karen was curled up in a ball, sobbing uncontrollably. Frank and Steve quickly approached Jerome, ready to help if necessary. Interrupting Jerome's outburst, I sternly told him to be quiet. Jerome, we're almost done. Just calm down and listen. We are not going to resort to physical violence unless absolutely necessary. Trust me. But you should know that your sons-in-law have their own plans for you, I explained, emphasizing the seriousness of the situation. Your wife and her brothers were far from thrilled when we shared the information with them, I continued. After telling him to get dressed, I noted that his transport should have already arrived. But before he leaves, I wanted to make sure that he understands the severity of the consequences. Before you leave, I should clarify that I have distributed copies of the evidence to the husbands of two women with whom you were involved, as well as to your wife, I said, shocking Jerome. Flushed with anger, Jerome began to threaten me. Taking a step back, I calmly replied, Be careful, Jerome. You just threatened in the presence of my lawyer and a police detective. I intervened to make Jerome understand the seriousness of his threat. Also, keep in mind that your threat is recorded on tape. Then, Mike handed me a sheaf of papers, which I handed to Gerald. Keeping calm, I continued to address Jerome. So, these are the divorce papers that your wife asked me to give you. I paused for a moment and then added, before I forget, she wanted me to let her know that she doesn't want to see you anymore. She hopes that you will go to hell and never come back. The shocking nature of this statement did not leave the room. I continued to share additional information. It's interesting that her brothers volunteered to pick you up tonight. They are waiting for you downstairs now, I said, firmly concluding the conversation. And now it's time for you to leave. At that moment, someone called my name, saying, Hey, Jim. Before Jerome left, it was necessary to inform him about the role played by Karen's brothers in gathering information about him. Don't forget to tell him about the significant help her brothers provided in gathering evidence against him, I reminded Gerald. Grateful for the reminder, I continued, yes, the documentation we provided to your wife covers a period of at least 15 years. With the help of his brothers, Frank carefully documented a total of 12 cases of adultery. At this moment, urgency was needed. You need to hurry. They're waiting for you downstairs, I advised Jerome. Steve immediately took Jerome's arm and guided him to the door. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I turned my attention to Karen, my lying and unfaithful wife. Tell me, I began, fixing my gaze on her. What does it feel like to know that the person you thought was the love of your life is playing a fool with you? How does it feel to realize that you were just a pawn in their game and not really loved? How does it feel to find out that you were just another object of Gerald's desire? How does it feel to realize that 30 years ago you were just one of his toys? 
How does it feel to know that he never really loved you? How does it feel to know that you weren't the only one he was playing and cheating on? And now, how do you understand that today you continue to be his toy? My words hung in the air, weighed down by the weight of the truth. Seeing the effect of my words, I made a short pause, giving the opportunity to realize the seriousness of the situation. Gathering my thoughts, I continued, you single-handedly destroyed our family. Tell me, how does it feel, baby? The silence dragged on as the weight of my words settled on us. After a while, I added, I told you 30 years ago that the worst thing you can do for our marriage is to betray my trust through infidelity. The destruction of our marriage is already unbearable, but to destroy our entire family for the sake of a man like Jerome is simply inexcusable. From that day on, you have eliminated joy from every holiday, every birthday, every graduation, every wedding, and every special family event. Because of your promiscuity, you have lost the respect not only of our children but also of our parents, my parents, and our friends. Just the sight of you disgusts me. It is impossible to believe that I have spent 30 years of my life loving a man who is nothing more than a dissolute person. When she was lying on the bed and sobbing, burying her head under the covers, I realized that she wasn't worth my precious time anymore. Get dressed and get ready to leave. Your father is waiting for you downstairs, I instructed her. Though he reluctantly agreed to take her home, he doesn't want to tell Alice about your infidelity. I don't have any more words to tell you. You have five minutes to put on the same clothes you were wearing when you let your lover enter our house tonight, and this is your only way out. If you don't want me to forcibly escort you downstairs, be sure your father is aware of your actions and knows the truth about your behavior. Now, please hurry up and get dressed, as you have only four minutes left. I earnestly ask you to fulfill this request. Let me wear something else, please. I understand that time is running out, but I can't get dressed when everyone is looking at me like that. Take into account my request, Karen pleaded. These people have already seen candid videos of you with your lover. However, time is running out. Get dressed immediately, I insisted. I must say that to call Karen's outfit outright would be an understatement. She was wearing a sheer blouse, a very short leather skirt, and huge four-inch heels. When Ben saw her, his reaction spoke volumes. Turning away in shock, he whispered, Oh my God, Jim, I'm afraid to take her home in this condition. Her mother may be very upset. This is definitely a difficult situation. On the one hand, I wanted her to leave dressed inappropriately, but on the other hand, I want to show respect to Ben and Alice, I remarked. There was silence in the room as everyone waited for my answer. Ben, I understand your situation. Steve, could you take them home in Ben's car? If I follow, it's not a problem. Since I deeply love and respect your parents, I'm willing to give you ten minutes to go upstairs and change. Let the countdown begin, I announced. With gratitude, Karen hurried upstairs. When she came back down, she was dressed more conservatively, like a typical soccer mom. I approached her and carefully took off her wedding and engagement rings, explaining that she did not deserve them. When she reached for her purse, I advised her to leave it. You will leave only in the clothes you were wearing, I asserted. Ben came up to me, shook my hand, and thanked me for letting her change. He promised that he would decide everything further. One of the most difficult tests for me was to tell the children the news about their mother's infidelity. Seeing the suffering in their eyes, trying to answer their questions, and watching them deal with the betrayal committed by their own mother was truly heartbreaking. Karen's infidelity not only destroyed our marriage but also deprived our children of a stable family. The reaction of my parents mirrored the reaction of my children, which further increased the pain. In the end, Amy made the decision to give up her football scholarship from North Carolina and join the Emory football team just to stay close to me. As a compromise, she agreed to live on campus with her teammates while studying at Emory. With her help, I was able to renovate the bedroom and buy new furniture for my house. When she's not at home, I sleep in the guest room. Dan and Benny started visiting me more often to check on me. I really appreciate that they take turns accompanying me to beer club meetings. Benny even took the trouble to grow hops for our beer club. We are planning to arrange a competition to see who brews the best beer using Benny's hops. It's nice to know that Amy looks after me and makes sure that her brothers keep in constant contact with me. Following the advice of our lawyers, 
Karen and I came to an agreement to divorce without coercion. Fortunately, Ben recognized the evidence I had of Karen's infidelity, which saved me from having to accuse her of adultery in order to gain control of the investment fund, as stipulated in our prenuptial agreement. This decision saved Ben, Alice, and Karen from the possible shame associated with a public trial. As a gesture of goodwill, I allowed Ben and Alice to soar out Karen's belongings and claim her personal belongings. Unexpectedly, two months later, Karen's father called me and offered to hold an official meeting in his office. Considering that we often talked on the phone, this request took me by surprise. For the past 25 years, Ben has been insistently asking me to join his family business, but I invariably refused, deciding to forge my own path and avoiding accusations that I was counting on his success. To my surprise, he recently started asking me to join him again. Instinctively, I raised my hand and resolutely refused his offer. I made it clear that I did not intend to become part of his company. Jim, I understand and appreciate your words of refusal, but this time the circumstances are different. Since I am approaching the age of 76, it is clear that Dan, for at least 15 years, will not be able to take over the management of the business. I was always sure that if something happened to me, you would step in and take control. The recent incident with Karen has had a heavy impact on Alice, and now she needs my support. Alice is so ashamed that she has isolated herself from friends, preferring to stay at home. Her consultant offered to take her away for a while. Jim, I'm asking you to help me take responsibility and guide Dan to a successful future. I am deeply saddened to hear about Alice's situation. Please give her my words of love. But, sir, I'm not ready to give you an answer tonight. I ask you to give me a few days to think about this issue. I need to get Alice and Karen out of Atlanta right away. Please let me know when you can give me an answer. I'll meet you here in three days to hear your answer. Say hi to your parents. I know that you usually consult with your father before making such decisions. See you in three days. Three days later, I informed Ben that I was accepting his offer. Dan is enthusiastic about his duties as custodian of the family business, and Ben is right. He has many more years ahead of him before he can lead the company. We meet with Dan and Ben every month. Bunny and Amy are having a conversation about our family business, making sure that Ben is aware of all the events. Thus Dan has a reliable support system to which he can turn for advice, just as I rely on my father and brother. Despite the fact that Karen moved to her parents in Florida, she maintains regular contact with the children. Dean and Benny often go to Florida to visit Karen, and Amy spends a couple of weeks there every summer. Karen also attends a few of Amy's soccer matches but keeps her distance from me. Alice is making progress, but it seems unlikely that she will return to Atlanta. As for Gerald, I do not know his whereabouts or what could have happened to him after his divorce from his wife. As I heard, he moved to one of the western regions. He gained a fairly good reputation, was involved in at least eight divorce proceedings, and was experiencing serious financial difficulties. Not only his life suffered, but also the fact that he played a role in the destruction of several marriages. However, you should not blame only him, these women deliberately made the decision to change their husbands. They were fully aware of their actions, planned their meetings in advance, and should bear equal responsibility with Jerome. I hope that in due time, I will find someone again whom I can love. I really miss communication in marriage, when there is someone to hug, talk to, and share my love. I will continue to get up every morning, express gratitude to God for my children, and adhere to a far-sighted approach to life until that very desired moment comes. I also want to say that Alice called me a week ago. She shared the sad news with Lena. Karen was recently diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and now she is being treated. Alice said it could end very badly for Karen. I sympathized with their experiences with Ben and asked them to keep me informed. Apparently, for my suffering and pain, karma overtook Karen. Story 2 Hello, my name is Jack. I want to share a story about my past relationship with my ex-girlfriend Maya. We were very much in love with each other, at least that's what I thought. Unfortunately, she destroyed my trust and cheated on me, which came as a complete shock to me. After the breakup, I met a wonderful woman named Maya. She had just graduated from college, while I was already working for a fast-growing technology company. From the moment I saw Maya, 
I felt an instant connection, although I couldn't figure out why. Our first meeting took place at the birthday of my friend's sister, who turned out to be a good friend with Maya since college. I couldn't help but notice that she noticed my gaze, as she was constantly looking in my direction throughout the party. Having overcome my insecurities, I finally plucked up the courage and approached her. Despite the fact that I did not fit into the generally accepted standards of beauty, having inherited a strong physique from my family, I have repeatedly faced rejection and ridicule from women in the past. Naturally, my expectations were underestimated when it came to Maya. She was stunning, and I expected to be either rejected or completely ignored. But to my pleasant surprise, she entered into a polite conversation with me. We spent the rest of the evening chatting casually, enjoying each other's company. It's been a long time since I've experienced such a feeling of happiness and self-confidence. Realizing that there was a connection between us, we exchanged contact details, and as soon as I arrived home, I immediately contacted her. Our relationship blossomed quickly, we began to spend more and more time together, chatting over lunch and having meaningful conversations every day. Our friendship grew stronger. Maya stood out from other women her age. Her kindness, wit, and intelligence won me over. From the very first conversation, it became clear that my sympathy for her goes far beyond her external beauty. Maya's intelligence and sense of humor initially attracted me. It wasn't often that I had the chance to go on a few dates, but she kindly gave me the opportunity. I've always been attracted to people with intelligence and ambition. I have never liked being around people who have no direction and aspirations. Maya embodied all the qualities that I admired. Having just graduated from college, she was actively looking for a job, willingly went to interviews, and jumped at any chance. Watching her determination and serious attitude toward her career, I only admired her more. Maya's parents made it clear to her that after graduation, she should solve her own problems. Unfortunately, the situation with her friend was getting more and more complicated. A friend was often sloppy, her boyfriend often came over, which was why their two-room apartment was cramped. It became obvious that such a situation negatively affected Maya's mental state. Worrying about her, I suggested that she take a break from the chaotic situation and move in with me. Although I was just starting my career in the technology industry, I was lucky to have a decent salary. With my income, I could easily support both of us without relying on Maya's financial help. We lived in a comfortable and spacious two-room apartment, and I was responsible for all the rent, bills, and food expenses. But I never considered it a burden because of my love for Maya. All the additional financial investments seemed insignificant to me. Perhaps it was blind love, but throughout our relationship, everything went surprisingly smoothly, and we rarely encountered any serious conflicts. Maya took over the household diligently, washed dishes, bought groceries, and satisfied my needs and desires in bed, making these moments incredibly pleasant. All this was before Masha and I started dating. Maya told me about her previous toxic relationship in college, where she endured abuse from her ex-boyfriend. Deeply sympathizing with her, I said that I was a gentleman and would always treat her with kindness and respect. I made her a promise and was ready to fulfill it. Throughout my life, I have never experienced anger issues or resorted to physical violence against anyone, especially a woman. Maya could be sure that she was safe in my presence. Besides, I've always been faithful in past relationships and wasn't going to betray Maya's trust. Fortunately, my job provided for a flexible schedule, 60% remote work and 40% on-site work. This flexibility allowed me to balance our home life and work in the office, providing us with enough time to live together. By openly talking about my schedule and allocating time for us, I wanted to show Maya that our relationship is built on trust and openness. To show my devotion to Maya, I set a rule from the very beginning of our relationship, we always informed each other about our whereabouts, who we were with, and what we were doing when we left the house. This was done to show her the depth of my sincerity and complete openness. Without hiding anything, I tried to create a trusting relationship between us. Over time, when our relationship became deeper, we began to make significant steps together. We introduced each other to our parents and soon to a close circle of friends. If I didn't have a best friend as such, then Maya had one. Her name was Andrea, and she often spent time with Maya. 
In fact, Andrea has become like a member of our extended family, regularly coming to our home and immersing herself in our lives. Andrea and Maya were roommates during college. While Maya dreamed of getting a job in a corporation, Andrea took the position of manager of a retail store in one of the famous establishments of our city. Living together with two sisters, also working professionals, Andrea led a turbulent life. Interestingly, Maya had the opportunity to work in the same supermarket where Andrea held the position of manager, but in an effort to make a career in the corporate world, Maya decided to refuse this offer. I noticed that she seemed pleased that I was providing for her, although I never openly told her about it. As a joke, Andrea sometimes teased Maya, calling her spoiled. In response, Maya defended herself, saying that she worked hard to achieve her goals as a teenager and while studying at college. Maya managed to work part-time, which testifies to her hard work. Considering all the efforts she put in, I thought she deserved rest and care. I had no doubts that I would take care of Maya. Moreover, I found joy in being able to provide and support my partner. One evening in a posh restaurant when we were celebrating my recent promotion, Maya suddenly started talking about marriage. It took me by surprise, but deep down, I was already thinking about settling down with her. Although her question may have surprised me for a moment, it didn't come as a complete shock to me. But at that moment, I still had a lot of ideas in my head. I decided to tell her that we would get married when the right moment came, and her smile and response calmed me down. To be honest, I wanted her to have a career before taking our relationship to the next level. Deep down, I have always dreamed of getting married and starting a family, and with the appearance of Maya in my life, these desires have become even stronger. Moreover, I have already bought an engagement ring, waiting for the right moment when she will decide on her professional activity. But suddenly, she came across a ring hidden in my closet. Before I had time to make the planned proposal, to avoid misunderstandings, I had to quickly adjust my plans and make an offer earlier than expected. When Maya first shared this news with her best friend Andrea, I noticed an unusual expression on her face, more shocked than enthusiastic. It was an unusual surprise that arises when you find out that a friend is getting married, but rather surprised that Maya decided to marry me. I expected Andrea to be more enthusiastic, especially considering she's going to be Maya's bridesmaid, but her reaction was far from enthusiastic. She asked, are you serious? At that moment, Andrea let out a sigh of despair and, throwing her purse on the floor, grabbed Maya's ring. With an effort, she forced herself to smile and looked at me. Believe me, after spending a significant amount of time with them, I felt that something was wrong. Knowing Andrea's expression, I could tell a genuine smile from a forced one. Although I decided not to raise this issue with Maya, I felt that Andrea was not genuinely happy for her friend. In the past, I've observed Andrea's behavior towards me, which has always seemed too pleasant to me. There was a case when the three of us were sitting in our apartment, and when Maya went into the kitchen to cook something to eat, Andrea subtly hinted that Maya might not be exactly who I take her for. I understood the subtext but decided not to pay attention. Curiously, I asked Andrea to clarify what she meant. Under the influence of alcohol, Andrea just assumed that in time, I would guess what she meant. Also, Andrea's hint wasn't explicit enough for me to draw any definitive conclusions. As a result, we continued to plan the wedding without thinking about her remark. Maya imagined a grand celebration, inviting all her friends, relatives, and even acquaintances. But this did not coincide with my wishes in any way. Not only was it burdensome from a financial point of view, since she did not contribute anything, but I also believed that there was life after the wedding. My desires went beyond the wedding ceremony itself. The thought of starting a family and having children was dear to me. Therefore, I considered it more practical to find a more spacious apartment and make other necessary preparations to accommodate our unborn child. This point of view influenced my preference for a more modest wedding, which would allow us to direct funds to create a solid foundation for our future together. Despite Maya's reasonable desire to arrange a lavish wedding, I expressed my doubts about this. We both understood the senselessness of an extravagant and expensive ceremony. To my surprise, Maya found a job just a few months before the wedding. Realizing that I couldn't afford to buy exactly the expensive wedding dress she wanted or cover the cost of bridesmaids dresses, she made the sensible decision to find a job and take on most of the expenses, freeing me from the financial burden. 
Her wise and practical choice made a strong impression on me, and it made me appreciate her even more. I hoped that after the marriage, she would continue to prioritize her career and contribute to our financial stability. In addition, I hoped that Maya's new job would allow her to make a financial contribution to our wedding plans. But to my surprise, she did not allocate any of her earnings for our wedding expenses. Instead, she channeled all her income into buying a wedding dress, shoes, accessories, and meeting the needs of her bridesmaids. Thus, I had most of the financial responsibility, including the costs of the wedding venue, the hall, cakes, and almost everything else. About two weeks before the wedding, I noticed that Andrea started sending me more and more text messages. She wanted to know if I had a good night's sleep or let me know when she went shopping with Maya. The frequency of her messages seemed excessive, and they were accompanied by a long list of superficial reasons for establishing contact. Alternatively, she came to our house under the pretext of helping Maya solve various tasks. Keeping calm so that Maya would not suspect hidden tension, but in the end, I reached the limit and was forced to turn to Andrea with a request to stop her excessive calls and messages. I was afraid that her persistent behavior could jeopardize my relationship with Maya, and I didn't want to let that happen. Unfortunately, I refrained from discussing this issue with Maya out of concern for their friendship and preparation for the upcoming wedding. I knew how deeply Maya loved and trusted Andrea, and I didn't want anything to overshadow their relationship. Deep down, I couldn't shake the nagging suspicion that Andrea's intentions weren't entirely sincere. It seemed like she was either trying to seduce me or convince me to reconsider marrying her best friend. During Maya's bachelorette party, the truth about Andrea's actions became clear. It was already late in the evening, and I found myself in the nightclub of the hotel where we were staying, enjoying drinks with my friends. It was at this moment that Andrea called me, insisting that she needed to show me something. At first, I hesitated, suspecting that she had ulterior motives and wanted to make one last attempt to seduce me. But when she mentioned Maya's name along with another familiar name, curiosity made me take one of my friends with me, and we went upstairs. Arriving at the hotel room where a small meeting was taking place, I noticed Andrea waiting for me outside the door. Something in her behavior suggested that she was going to report information that was hard to believe. When I turned the door handle, I was overcome by a feeling of horror that made my heart ache. Before the door swung open, I caught the faint sounds of pleasure coming from the room, and every second, the tension in my chest tightened. The sight that presented itself to me was nothing but shock. Maya was sitting on another man, whom I assumed was a male stripper hired by them for entertainment. Barely noticing my presence, she abruptly pulled away and rushed to cover herself with a sheet. I immediately recognized the man standing in front of me as Andrea had warned, it was her ex-boyfriend from college. Tears involuntarily welled up in my eyes from the emotions that overwhelmed me. The severity of the situation was simply unbearable. In complete bewilderment and fear, I silently left the room, leaving Maya and Andrea behind. My friend, who accompanied me, was no less shocked by the picture that opened before us. Trying to comfort or reason with me, he tried to start a conversation, but I waved him away, refusing to comfort. With a heavy heart, I continued to walk down the corridor, and Maya's voice still sounded in the air. I could hear Maya's desperate screams as she interrogated Andrea, demanding to explain why she had betrayed her so much. Amid the chaos, the tension was broken by Andrea's response, who stated that I deserved someone better than Maya. She claimed that I was only kind to her and urged her to leave her previous partner for me. According to Andrea, Maya wanted to get everything at once, not wanting to part with the current relationship and seeking something else. I didn't turn around to look at the continuation of their argument. It was an unbearable blow for me to realize that Maya had been cheating on me throughout our entire relationship. The pain was overwhelming, and I desperately wanted to find a way to deal with it, but it seemed impossible. Even Andrea tried to follow me and comfort me, but I didn't hesitate to shut her out by slamming the door in her face. To numb the pain, I drowned in alcohol, seeking solace in the haze of intoxication. I drank glass after glass until the line between reality and illusion was blurred beyond recognition. When I woke up the next morning, I was hit by a barrage of missed calls from Maya and other people who were undoubtedly worried about me. When I left the room, I saw that Maya had already put on her wedding dress. She looked completely dejected. As soon as her eyes met mine, she rushed to me and asked in a trembling voice why I hadn't dressed for our wedding. 
Hearing her words, anger flare up in me, which spurred my actions. In a fit of anger, I pushed Maya away from me, abruptly announced that I was canceling our wedding. Stunned silence reigned in the room. Everyone looked at each other in shock and confusion, asking why I suddenly changed my mind. Even my parents were stunned by my sudden decision, considering that we had invested heavily in preparing for the wedding. But because of the depth of my heartache, I could not explain the reasons for my action. Locked in my room, I sought solace within its walls. From behind the closed door, I could hear the voices of my parents and our friends asking me about the reasons for my sudden change of mood. But Maya did not react to what was happening, preferring to simulate a loss of consciousness. Several worried people hurried to pick her up before she fell to the floor. In the morning when the remnants of the previous night were cleaned up, I collected my few belongings from the hotel room before leaving. I turned off my phone, leaving an apologetic message in my friend's WhatsApp group chat. It was a request for understanding as I really didn't know how else to react at that moment. A week has passed since that fateful day, and I still can't realize that I was deceived. It's a hard way to come to terms with the realization that the person I trusted deceived me. I want to say, why I didn't do a thorough background check on Maya through my friend's sister before we started dating. To tell the truth, I made a stupid mistake. At the time, I didn't feel the need to be overly cautious. But I remember that in the early stages of our relationship, I delicately asked my friend's sister about Maya. She mentioned that they studied at different faculties and communicated only through a mutual friend in college. After graduating from college, they lost touch, so her story did not bring much clarity. Speaking of Maya, we saw each other yesterday, and she was furious that I didn't come to our wedding. Maya didn't seem to notice her own actions, exposing me as an enemy in this unfortunate story. She further explained to her parents that I canceled the wedding due to excessive alcohol consumption the night before, explaining this by the lack of common sense in my actions. Apparently, she took my silence for naivety. In fact, I no longer wanted to have any relationship with her, and I could not understand why she believed that we could save our relationship. To top it all off, she openly admitted that during our acquaintance, she was having an affair with her ex-boyfriend, and this upset me even more. She justified it by the fact that I was often busy at work, and this seemed to justify her infidelity. In light of recent events, I am at a complete loss. Maya claims that I didn't pay her enough attention, that I simply neglected her needs, but I don't see how that can be true. I have never refused her requests or ignored her wishes. On the contrary, it was thanks to her that I worked tirelessly, striving to fulfill all our financial obligations and at the same time taking care of her. Even now, as I write these words, the thought that she had a secret relationship with her boyfriend does not leave me. Now she has the audacity to suggest setting another wedding date to save face from the shame caused by the cancellation of our ceremony. It is unpleasant to think that she only once apologized for the pain she caused me, thereby emphasizing the harsh truth that she never really loved and appreciated me the way I loved her. In the end, my decision was unequivocal. I can't marry Maya. It became clear that our relationship was one-sided and determined solely by her own interests. Therefore, I made a difficult choice. I evicted her from my house and changed the locks as a necessary step towards ending the relationship. After meeting Maya, I also took the opportunity to express my gratitude to Andrea for unwittingly helping me avoid a disastrous future. Thanks to Andrea, I found out that Maya used the money I gave her to provide for her boyfriend's needs. When Maya asked for exorbitant amounts for personal purchases, it turned out that she transferred them to him. In addition, I forgot to mention that during our joint classes, Maya constantly went to the gym. She showed an undeniable obsession with maintaining physical fitness. Maya's unfamiliar daily routine when she went to the gym every day did not arouse any suspicions in me, but I recently found out that at this time, she was dating her college boyfriend, often claiming that she was with Andrea when it wasn't. Maya asked Andrea to cover for her, essentially hiding her true location. After learning about this, I began to understand why Andrea was so shocked when Maya said we were engaged just a few days before. Maya confessed to Andrea her strong love for her student boyfriend and said about her desire to live with him together. Now I understand that the constant messages and calls from Andrea were an attempt to find a way to reveal the truth to me. I hate to admit that Andrea was desperately looking for an opportunity to tell me about the deception that was unfolding behind my back. 
I blame myself for not recognizing the signs and not giving her the opportunity to confess. There are times when I wonder if I didn't deserve it because it's so easy to deceive me, but I made a firm decision, there will be no new wedding. In two days, I will meet Maya again to return her things and completely break off our relationship. Three weeks ago, I met Maya for the second time, and something unexpected happened during our conversation. I firmly said that we would never be together again, let alone discuss the prospect of marriage. In response to this, Maya, looking into my eyes, uttered words that took me by surprise. Do you honestly believe that canceling our wedding will increase your chances of finding a better woman? Let's be honest, no sane woman would want to be with an obese man like you. Consider yourself lucky to have the chance to marry someone like me. These words cut me like a knife. I've never faced such hurtful insults before, especially from a person I once loved or who claimed to love me. At that moment, it became painfully clear to me what kind of person she was. It was hard to accept, but I realized that she had been using me all this time. I am fully aware of my weight, but I have never wanted a marriage in which my wife would think she was doing me a favor or would view me as a person unworthy of love and respect. I was well aware of the deplorable consequences such marriages often lead to. On that fateful day, our conversation was limited to the fact that Maya, in a fit of anger, threw her wedding ring at me and ran out of the house. I decided to block her on all our shared social networks and even blocked her number. But before I cut off contact with her parents, I took the opportunity to visit them and frankly tell them the truth about their daughter's behavior. This revelation caused them deep disappointment. About a week later, after the incident when Maya unexpectedly left me in a cafe, I began to receive persistent calls from an unfamiliar number. With growing curiosity, I answered the call. As soon as I answered, I immediately recognized Maya's voice, which had noticeably changed. It became calm and more respectful. She directly asked for a personal meeting, explaining that she had something important to tell. But I insisted on hearing everything over the phone. Without waiting for an answer, Maya began to offer sincere apologies, urging me to forgive and let go of the past so that we could start all over again. To my surprise, before I could answer, Maya abruptly intervened and informed me that she was pregnant. This revelation seemed strange to me, and I did not have time to collect my thoughts as Maya continued to speak without giving me the opportunity to utter a word. I'm pregnant with your baby, Rick, Maya said causing me to burst out laughing, believing that this was a joke in honor of April Fool's Day. I jokingly noticed that April had not yet come, and she was already playing me. Brushing aside her words, I quickly ended the conversation. As expected, Maya continued to call me persistently, and I blocked the number in frustration. It turned out that her boyfriend left her after finding out that she could no longer support him, and also after she told him about her pregnancy. Trying to deceive and manipulate me, she decided that she would be able to pull off a clever trick. After this incident, she constantly tried to contact me by different numbers, which I diligently drove away. To my shock and horror, Maya appeared on the doorstep uninvited. Unfortunately, at that moment, Andrea appeared on the threshold. Seeing Andrea, Maya launched a furious verbal attack, hurling vile insults and accusing Andrea of being the cause of the destruction of her best friend's life. It got to the point where she accused both Andrea and me of having an affair and betraying her trust. The situation escalated to such an extent that I had no other choice but to turn to the authorities and involve the police. Yesterday, I took further legal action by obtaining a restraining order against Maya. I can only imagine how hard Maya's life is without a permanent job and help in raising a child. As for me and Andrea, there is nothing romantic or illegal between us. I do not assume that there will be any relationship between us in the future. Although Andrea sometimes comes to see me, there is no deep connection between us except friendship and support. At the moment, I am focused on rebuilding my life and finding a way to heal from this broken heart. Although forgiveness remains a difficult task, I find some comfort in the fact that my actions have led to consequences for her. I continue to walk the path of healing and moving forward. I welcome any advice and support from this community, as it has helped me maintain a sense of clarity throughout this difficult process. The pain caused by betrayal is certainly a cruel blow, but I am still determined to find the strength and rebuild my life.